We are living in such an arrogant time when everyone's opinion is so strong and there's so much division because everyone is so sure that they are right. And that's what I love about the book of Job, because you, you see, it's, it's a bunch of humans speaking to one another, and they're arguing and trying to figure something out. And then at the end, God comes through and he speaks. You see, when, when we're going through the pain, it's so hard to not get myopic in our thinking and just just think about how I feel at this moment. But we have to look at the big picture. That's the point of the book of Job, that again, we are here to bring glory to him no matter what comes my way. The book of Job teaches us to live life with the reality that we are being watched right now that there's this battle going on and I'm somehow a part of it. We need that voice from God where his words cut through everyone else's and there's authority that is so needed for this generation. But the question is, is are we going to be humble enough to understand this message? Think about the words, unshakable hope. What do they mean to you? What does it look like to have unshakable hope when your life feels adrift in a sea of fear, uncertainty, tragedy, or grief? Hebrews 6, 19 says, we have this hope as an anchor for the soul, firm and secure. Now we cannot deny that there are a lot of storms out there. Storms that affect our finances, our families, our futures. At times, these storms can rock our boat so badly that we fear it will sink. But people who have anchored their lives in God's Word know that when the tempest come, they can cling to Christ and find He is there with them in the midst of it. During the 12 weeks in this study, we will explore several key promises that we find in the Bible. And we will look how God offers hope through each of them and how we can be sure He will keep them. So, if you need some hope today, join me on this journey, and together we will discover how it is possible to build our lives on the unshakable promises of God. Everything has a starting point. You had a starting point. Faith has a starting point as well. For most of us, we began to believe something about God as children, and then we became adults, and it didn't work anymore. And there was this growing gap between what we were told as children and what we experienced as adults. Sometimes adults need a new starting point. So we're gonna hit the restart button. What if we'd never heard any of those stories? Where would we start? What if we didn't know anything? Where would we start? Because starting off with faith as a child is very different than starting off with faith as an adult. Hi friends, my name is Julie Thomasma and I'm excited that we are gonna be hosting Coffee Mom and Jesus again this fall. So this last spring, we started with a group of women just to talk about everyday mom struggles. We talked about everything from you know just day-to-day -day struggles of what we deal with as a mom and we lifted each other up and we always left with one thing that we could take and implement in our day-to-day -day life and so i'm excited to extend that opportunity again we're going to start our class on sunday september 17th at 9 15 and of course we're going to have coffee again and child care will be provided and we'll be meeting in room 203. so i hope that you can join us and this invite is extended to all moms out there who just need the support of other moms who are like-minded and want to really talk about family values and how we can operate with, with God's Word in mind.
Good morning, church. Will you guys stand with us while we worship? Church, you may be seated. Good morning to our online congregation. Also, my name is Alan. I'm part of the pastoral staff here at the Williamston Free Methodist Church. And here at WFMC, we want to be a church that loves Jesus, makes disciples, and serves our community. Something that I've been thinking about adding to that mission statement is that we're dedicated to crushing mosquitoes. Um, for real, like, I was out in the yard around the perimeter and we have all these autumn olive trees and if you've never had an autumn olive they're really good some people might be like oh they taste a little bit bitter but I was out picking them and eating them and all the mosquitoes are just flocking around me and I asked them politely like please don't bite me not like please don't and I with such a short lifespan you think that they would listen to me they did not so I just started crushing them and then walked away I said fine till next time all right but uh, we do want to serve our community, and one of the ways that we can serve our community is getting connected with our community. So if you are new, or even semi-new, there should be a connection card in the seat back in front of you. 
And if you want to get connected, if you want to give us some of your information so that we could learn how to serve and love you more, um, we would love to do that. So please, please just grab one of those connection cards. You can fill that out, and then you can put it in one of the uh, plates, uh, offering plates as you leave the sanctuary today. Uh, we also have these brochures in the seats laying around. If you just kind of look around, you'll be able to see one of those. We have adult classes starting up in, in the very near future. I think Sunday, September 17th is going to be our first day for our Sunday class. Uh, but we're also going to have classes that aren't on the weekends, that are not on Sundays. And so all the information that you need is going to be in that brochure. A lot of great ways for you to connect and grow in your faith through those classes. Uh, another way that you can connect with us, again, if you are new or even semi-new, we have a connection lunch coming up on October 1st. So as a staff, we meet down in the fellowship hall. We serve you some food. We get to know you. You get to know us. And so if you've never been able to connect with us in that way, uh, if you call the office, our secretary, Tammy, she will make sure that you are on that list and we'll serve you some food and get to know you on October 1st. Next, I'm going to invite Sheree Zesky up to the stage for our next announcement. She's an amazing woman of God, so please give her a hand. Thank you. Good morning. I want to share with you a new program that um, we're starting here at the church. Many of you know that for about 15 years, I've been a volunteer at pregnancy services in East Lansing. And I've been a counselor, a parenting a leader, and then recently in the clothing ministry. And just recently, shared pregnancy, who is located in downtown Lansing, and pregnancy services merged. So we are now known as Shared Pregnancy of East Lansing. And that means that some of our programs have changed. Um, we still have the same mission. We still give free pregnancy tests and ultrasounds and encourage women with unplanned pregnancies to choose life for their baby. And we do that using tools of uh, pregnancy tests, free pregnancy tests, free ultrasounds, counseling. And then we also offer material things that they need for their babies. So pregnancy services would offer those clothing um, services up to 18 months. Shared pregnancy has offered them up to 4T. So consequently, we don't have a lot of those larger sizes at our place in East Lansing. So I'm coming to you for this. In the past, this church has just been very generous in our programs. The uh, baby bottle ministry, the, the diaper drive, have been very generous. So now I'm asking you to fill the crib. We have a porta crib in the narthex. There is a list over the crib of needed items. And on the table under the bulletin board, there's also some of these sheets. So we need clothing from 18 months to 4T, boys and girls. Gently used, new. We also need new books, uh, small toys. Each bag that we give out has a book and a toy for each child. So I'm asking you to be generous. The, the crib will be out there the whole month of September. So let's fill the crib more than once. Thank you, Shree. Our last announcement, you might need your phone out for this one. Uh, recently, we had an all-church meeting on a Sunday after church, and we just wanted to hear what was going on um, in your life and where we could meet some of the needs that we weren't meeting or maybe not meeting. And we heard over and over again that the church wants better communication for urgent prayer requests. So we listened to that, and Pastor Neil, he's amazing in so many ways, and he got to work, and he figured out that our one call now text thread system can um, create a way for us um, right here and now, if you get out your phone, to just text 22300. And if you get out your phone and you want to be a part of that urgent prayer request, that's what you're going to do. You're going to go on your keypad and text 22300, and you're going to text hashtag text prayer. 
And then what's going to happen is if you're already signed up for our One Call Now system, you're going to start um, getting text messages for our urgent prayer requests. If you're not a part of that system, there's going to be a link with some prompts for you to sign up and be a part of our text thread for, through One Call Now. And so what's going to happen is as we receive these urgent prayer requests, we're going to then send them out to the subgroup that's being created through this text. And so then anything that might be coming um, to us that needs to go out to you as our prayer warriors, you will then be getting. Now, um, one thing that I need to communicate, or actually a couple things, um, first one is we need direct contact from the family who we're praying for or a family member of the person that we're praying for. If someone calls us with a prayer need and they're not of the family, we're going to tell them have one of their family members contact us because we don't want to put out any information that's sensitive. Uh, the other thing is it's going to be an urgent prayer request. We're not going to be giving up many or giving out many updates. So as we have one of these urgent prayer requests come up, there are many updates that sometimes follow. If you want those, you need to be a part of the email thread. If you don't want to be a part of that email thread or you can't get those, when you leave the sanctuary, the main doors, and you turn to the right, on the wall there is prayer requests that go out. It's we, um, Tammy, our secretary, she prints those out. She posts those there. And so you can get the updates for those prayer requests um, from week to week if you are not um, wanting to jump on an email or you don't use email. But for that first initial push for that urgent prayer request, it's going to go to this one call now text thread, this subgroup. And again, if you text um, or 22300, hashtag text prayer, immediately you'll be a part of that subgroup. And if you're not a part of that one call now system, they're gonna, there, there will be a link for, and some prompts for you to follow uh, so that you can be a part of that system. So with that being said, that's the last of the announcements except for our offering. There are three different ways that you can give here at the Williamston Free Methodist Church. You can do it online, you can mail in a check, or you can drop um, an offering off in the offering plate as you leave the sanctuary. I'm going to pray, and then I'm going to hand it back over to the worship team. Lord, we thank you for um, all the ways you bless us. All the things that we get to experience on a day-to-day -day basis. The things that bring us joy and peace and happiness and love. And Lord, we also just want to say thank you for some of the difficult things that make us dependent on you and develop our character. And so we are blessed in so many ways with so many things. And Lord, as we give back just a little bit, Lord, we just pray that you would use those gifts and offerings to multiply that love, that joy, that peace to the, to the whole world. Lord, I pray that you would bless the giver and the gift and the rest of service, Jesus. In your name, amen. You guys stand with us. And let the king of my heart be the mountain where I run, the fountain I drink from, oh, he is my song. And let the king of my heart be the shadow where I hide, the ransom for my life, oh, he is my song. Cause you are good, you're good, oh, you are good, you're good, oh. Let the king of my heart be the wind inside my sails, the anchor in the waves, oh, he is my song. And let the king of my heart be the fire inside my veins, the echo of my days, oh, he is my song. And let the king of my heart be the wind inside my sails, the anchor in the waves, oh, he is my song. And let 
the King of my heart. Be the fire inside my heart. You're never gonna let me down. You're never gonna let. You're never gonna let me down. You're never gonna let. You're never gonna let me down. You're never gonna let. You're never gonna let me down. You're never gonna let. You're never gonna let me down. You're never gonna let. You're never gonna let me down. You're never gonna let. You're never gonna let me down. 'Cause you are good. You're good. It all. You are good. You're good. Oh, you are good. You're good. Privilege this morning. Is that fine? Yep. It's my privilege this morning to lead in Holy Communion. Every time I personally come to take communion, I always ask myself, "Are you taking the time to really engage with God?" Last week, Spencer, in his message, drew our attention to having a true, meaningful experience when we come together in God's house to worship. It's about engaging in your spirit with God's spirit. It's about experiencing Him. So, may I encourage you to engage? Experiencing God's presence as you partake of Holy Communion this morning. Let it be a sacred time, remembering Christ. Do more than walk through it as a ceremony. If you do that, that's about all it is. But it's time to engage with Him in a very meaningful, special way. I thought it'd be good for us this morning to begin uh, as a congregation, reading together a key verse. In fact, it's the verse that.
covers the whole gospel. John 3.16, please read with me. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have everlasting life. Wow. That's a powerful scripture. We probably all learned it in our childhood, and we can rattle it off quickly, but do we let it engage and speak to us about what Jesus really did for us? And it's very fitting when we take communion. This is really the great promise to all believers, which is consummated through the death and crucifixion of Jesus for our sins. We celebrate this resurrection, his resurrection as believers forgiven with the promise of eternal life. All of that in John 3, 16. Jesus came to earth knowing that his mission would lead to a painful death, becoming sin for us. Every time I read that, I'm thinking, wow, that really separated him from the Father. He drank the bitter cup so that we could drink the cup of sweet salvation through his broken body and his shed blood to experience forgiveness and eternal life. Remind yourself of the price he paid. I had a pastor who preached a beautiful sermon once and he said, if you don't know what was done just slip up and take a look into the cup that he drank for you, the bitter cup. In Matthew, it speaks of what he experienced, how excruciating it was. He went on a little further and bowed with his face to the ground, praying, My Father, if it is possible, let this cup of suffering be taken away from me. Yet I want your will to be done, not mine. So Jesus instituted Holy Communion with his disciples, exhorting them to do this in remembrance of him. And as we take communion, could I just encourage you to take that message personally in remembrance? Of, it's kind of like, don't forget me. If you forget Jesus, you've lost the gospel. We too come to be reminded and remember what he did for us. Now, in the Free Methodist Church, it's open communion. If you are a guest and a born-again believer, we welcome you to join in as a part of the body of Christ. You do not have to be a member of the Free Methodist Church in order to partake of communion with us. So, as we partake in the Holy Sacrament, take time to engage with God to prepare your heart for communion. Communion is, in simple terms, coming into union with Christ. It's both individual and it's corporate. It's binding us together, we are the body of Christ. Could we have those who are going to be assisting please come to the table? Ushers will be directing you from the rear to the front. Those of you in the two sections on each side will either come to the aisle to your right or to your left and come to the table near you. Circle around and go back into the row of seats where you were at the beginning. Those in the middle will all come to the middle aisle, circling back to each side and returning to your seat. And please hold the elements and we will partake together. So, those who are unable, 
please raise your hand or wait and someone will be happy to come and serve you where you are. We don't want anyone to be left out of celebrating Christ. Let's pray. Prayer preparation. God, I pray this now and speak to my heart, to the heart of every person here. May God, we be sensitive and aware of your holiness, your presence, and most of all, so grateful for what you did for us on the cross. We pray, God, that you would help us to remember Jesus. Thank you, Father. We pray now that you would bless as we partake in the elements of the Holy Communion in this sacred hour. In Jesus' name, amen. I think it works best if you stand and the uh, ushers will direct you to come and receive the elements. surrounding me let it break at your name still call the sea to still the rage in me to still every way at your name Jesus Jesus you make the darkness tremble in Jesus, Jesus. You silence fear in Jesus, Jesus. You make the darkness tremble in Jesus, Jesus. Breathe, call these bones to live. Call these lungs to sing once again. And I will praise and breathe. Call these bones to live. And call these lungs to sing and once again. I will praise Jesus, Jesus. You make the darkness tremble in Jesus. Jesus, you silence me, Jesus, Jesus, you make the darkness tremble, and Jesus, Jesus, oh, your name is a light that the shadows can't deny, your name cannot be overcome. Your name is alive, forever lifted high. Your name cannot be overcome. Your name is alive that the shadows can't deny. Your name cannot be overcome. Your name is alive. Forever lifted high, your name cannot be overcome. In Jesus, Jesus, you make the darkness tremble. In Jesus, Jesus, you silence me. Jesus, Jesus. You make the darkness tremble in Jesus, Jesus. Your name is a light that the shadows can't deny. Your name 
cannot be overcome. Your name is alive forever lifted high. Your name cannot be overcome. We need some also. <laughs> Just pray briefly here. Father, we consecrate these elements. May the very symbols of the broken body of Christ touch us anew and afresh. May your cup that represents the shedding of blood for the forgiveness of our sins refresh our souls in you. We thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. As they were eating, Jesus took the bread and after blessing it, he broke it and gave it to them and said, take, this is my body. Take and eat and be thankful, remembering his body was broken for you and for me. He suffered that we partake. took the cup and when he had given thanks he gave it to them and they drank all of it and he said to them this is my blood of the new covenant which is poured out for many the writer of Hebrews put it this way without the shedding of blood there is no remission of sin take the cup and drink and be thankful for his shed blood for the remission of yours and my sin. Shall we pray? Thank you, our Heavenly Father, for the remembrance, for the reminder. Thank you for your love. Bless now, God, as we continue in worship to you. In Jesus' name, amen. And you can turn your empty cups in at a basket on your way out of the door, close to those who are ushering. If I can get all my stuff, and then thank you. Amen. Thank you, Lynn. At this time, we are going to dismiss the children. Um, you guys are dismissed to head downstairs. And we are going to um, introduce a new song today. It's called All Hail King Jesus. So if you guys will stand with us, we're going to go into that. And the, uh, the chorus reads, All Hail King Jesus, All Hail the Lord of Heaven and Earth. All hail King Jesus, all hail the Savior of the world. So you guys join with us this morning. There was a moment when the lights went out When death had claimed its victory The King of Love had given up his life The darkest day in history There on the cross they made for sinners 
for every curse is blood atoned. One final breath and it was finished. But not the end we could have known. For the earth began to shake and the veil was torn. What sacrifice was made as the heavens rolled in all hail King Jesus in all hail the Lord of heaven and earth in all flash of light breaking through when all was lost he crossed eternity the king of life was on the moon for in a dark cold tomb where our lord was One miraculous breath, and we're forever changed. He God, we thank you for overcoming this world and giving us life through the blood that you shed on that cross, Lord. We enthrone you this morning, God. We put you on the throne. We 
give you all the glory and the honor, Lord. I just pray over Neil as he gives this message that you would speak through him, Lord. And we would apply those words from your scriptures to our hearts and beyond these walls to go out and make disciples for you, Lord. It's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. doing this morning? Good, good. Didn't the worship team do an awesome job of leading us right to the throne of Jesus this morning? Amen. Thank you, worship team. So the past five weeks, we have been in a series called Invitation to Discipline, and, and we practiced prayer, and we practiced fasting. Was that the first time anyone has ever fasted before? Anyone fast for the first time during that series? No? Well, you guys have been fasting before then. That's awesome. We, we dug into scripture study and talked about service. And, and Spencer wrapped up with an awesome message and testimony about worship and what it means to worship God. And our prayer and hope for that series was that would just usher in continued spiritual disciplines in our lives that would draw us closer and closer to Jesus with every day. So today we're going to be moving into a series called Chasing the One, and I hope you got just a, a little glimpse from that, from that clip of kind of what we're, what we're going for this series. Um, one thing I want to do is, as I begin is I want you to think of these different stories from Scripture. If you know them, just kind of rattle your brain back to how did these, how did these flow, what was happening in there. If, if you don't, that's okay. Check these stories out later and look, search them on Google. You'll find them there. Um, so think about these stories. And what do they have in common? So the, the story of the Samaritan woman, also known as the woman at the well that Spencer talked about last week. You remember, Jesus goes through Samaria and meets this woman at the well and tells her everything about her life and says, I can give you living water, right? Think about when Jesus heals the lepers. When they come to him and say, Jesus, would you heal me? And Jesus just embraces them. And then he heals them. And what was special about that was people didn't touch lepers back in Jesus' day. They were thought to be dirty and unclean, and it would make them, whoever touched them, ceremonially unclean. It was also thought to be contagious, but Jesus touches them. Think about Jesus healing a couple demon-possessed men, where he, he sails across the Sea of Galilee and meets these men who are going crazy in the cemetery, and he heals them. Everybody know the story of Zacchaeus? What's the famous line? Zacchaeus, the wee little man. Right. So we all know the story of Zacchaeus, maybe. Um, so the, sto the short of the story is there was this guy who he was short, and he, he wanted to see Jesus. 
And there was just big crowds around Jesus, and so he couldn't get up to see Jesus. So he climbs up in this tree, right, just to get a glimpse of the Savior. And as Jesus is walking by, Jesus says, Zacchaeus, get out of that tree. Come down here. I'm going to eat at your house tonight. These are just a few of the stories of Scripture and how Jesus chased after the one. What was Jesus doing in these stories? He was chasing after the one who was lost, the one who was outcast, the one who was downtrodden, the one without hope. Have you ever been there? Have you found yourself lost without hope? Like something was missing? Maybe alone? Just like Jesus chased after the heart of those in his time when he walked this earth, Jesus has been chasing after your heart. If you have faith in Jesus, it is a result of God's pursuit of you. God has been chasing after you. We call that, here's a big term for you, prevenient grace or the grace that goes before, making it possible for you to see Jesus and know Jesus. The fact that you're here today, the fact that you are listening to this message is one of the ways that God is chasing after you, that God wants to tell you that he loves you. From the beginning of time, all the way back to the beginning, right? God has been chasing after the heart of his creation. Look back to Adam and Eve, right? They lived in the Garden of Eden. They walked with God and they talked with God, right? As the old hymn goes. And, and they had an open relationship with God and then they broke it. So Adam and Eve hid. But what does God do? He went looking for them. He was chasing after them, even when they hid, even when they didn't want to be with God. God came after them. He pursued them and called to them and looked for them. Throughout this series, we're going to be looking at examples of how Jesus chased after the lost and how we might learn from his example in our lives and help us chase after those who are lost. But today, I want to start at, I think, an appropriate beginning. I want to talk about how God is chasing after you, how God is chasing after your heart, after your life. One unassuming story of Jesus chasing after one comes when he was calling his disciples. Right? So Jesus had, had this mission on earth to make some disciples and, and have them follow after him and teach all the things that he taught people. And it's probably not one that might come to your mind when, chasing, when we think of chasing after the one. And for me, a couple years ago, it wasn't either. But I love how this story displays Jesus chasing after the one. The story is when Jesus calls the disciple Matthew, he's also known as Levi, to follow him. And I want us to watch this depiction from the show The Chosen. And I just love the way that this show brings to life th this story. So our care group that I'm in has watched this whole series together. And I love the way that this, this show just brought to life the story of Jesus in new ways for me. No, I realize that the creators took some creative liberties when creating the show, and it should not be taken as a replacement for the Bible, but it can be a great way, and a great tool to share the story of Jesus and to place ourselves in that story and to better understand the story. So we're going to play this clip of The Chosen, if you will all uh, turn your attention towards the screen. A mother of a son with talent like yours should be proud. She's ashamed that I could use the talent that God gave me against God. Next. You're good at something. You found a way to make a living doing it. It's that simple. Must be nice to live in a world so simply ordered. We live in the same world, Matthew. Next. Besides, what else are you going to do with a mind like yours?
Matthew. Matthew, son of Alpheus. Yes. Follow me. Me? <laughs> yes, you. Whoa, whoa, whoa. Oh. What are you doing? You want me to join you? Keep moving, street preacher. Do you have any idea what this guy has done? Do you even know him? Yes. Listen, I said to... What are you doing? Where do you think you're going, guys? Let me go. Have you lost your mind? You have money. Quintus protects you. No Jew lives as good as you. You're gonna throw it all away. Yes. I don't get it. You didn't get it when I chose you either. But this is different. I'm not a tax collector. Get used to different. I'm glad we passed by your booth today, Matthew. Yes. Shall we? We have a celebration to prepare for. You will regret this, Matthew. What's the tablet for? I grabbed it without thinking. You can put it back. No, no, keep it. You may yet find use for it. Where are we going? A dinner party. I'm not welcome at dinner parties. Well, that's not going to be a problem tonight. You're the host. This is probably like the 14th time I've watched that clip. I just lo I love it. It, it. It's so impactful. And I love the way that the clip depicts Jesus chasing after Matthew. As the group of disciples are walking by, they make eye contact for just a second, Jesus and Matthew. And, and then the group continues to go, right? But then you see this moment where Jesus pauses for just a second and turns around. Almost as if the Holy Spirit were speaking to him or God the Father was speaking to him. He had this inclination that I need to call Matthew. And he turns around and calls Matthew and Matthew's like, you talking to me, right? Because a Jew was addressing Matthew. You see, back in the day, tax collectors were outsiders. They were despised. And especially Matthew, because he was a Jew, but in the, in the clip it said that his parents thought that he was betraying God. You see, tax collectors were, were thought of betraying God and betraying their fellow Jews because they were forcing the Jews to collect taxes or pay taxes to Caesar. And yet here is Jesus, a Jew, calling to Matthew to follow him. It's likely that no Jew ever invited Matthew to anything. He was an outcast likely even by his own family. And yet here's Jesus inviting him, chasing after him to follow him. I love when you study the Bible and, and the stories in and of themselves just speak so powerfully. But then when you explore the, the greater context of a story or a verse, it, it just expands its power and impact. And this is one of those stories that, that is paired with several other stories of Jesus chasing after the one. So right before Jesus calls Matthew, let's look at what's happening. If you've got a Bible, go ahead and grab that, or if you want to pull out your app, we're going to Matthew chapter 8. I'll give you just a second to turn there. So th th this is kind of the beginning of Jesus' ministry. Um, several things have already happened. Um, but in chapter 8, 
Um, we, we've already got the, uh, the Beatitudes there, so we're picking up in chapter 8 here. And Jesus goes and heals a man with leprosy. Remember how, how I introed about Jesus reaching out and touching a man with leprosy and healing him? Then it, it continues on, and if you look at verse 23, I want to call this to our attention of chapter 8. It says, um, they got into a boat, and, um, and his disciples followed him. So they were currently, we've got a map of this, they were currently in Capernaum, um, top left-hand corner, city up there, um, and uh, they were doing ministry in Capernaum. Um, and so they get into a boat, and they're going to go all the way down to the southeast corner of the Sea of Galilee there. So sk skip that miracle of Jesus calming the storm for a second, and look at verse 28. When they arrive on the other side of the sea, there's these two demon-possessed men, and Jesus heals them. So, so Jesus is doing ministry over here in Capernaum and decides it's time to go across the sea. There's about a 10-mile gap there across the sea. Skipping the, the fact that they just sailed through a storm probably took several hours to take them there, right? It wasn't just a quick 15-minute drive. So they get to the other side, they heal these men, and you think then, okay, they're, they're on the other side of the lake, let's go do some ministry over here. That's not what they do. What do they do? Chapter 9, verse 1. Jesus steps into the boat and crossed over and came to his own hometown. Jesus, what are you doing here? You just spent multiple hours in a boat to go across the sea to heal a couple guys. He was chasing after them. But that was done now. But he knew there's some guys on the other side of the lake who need me. So he gets back into the boat in verse 1 and sails all the way back to Capernaum. Who's waiting for him? You see in the, in the rest of these verses, the first nine or eight verses there, he heals a paralyzed man. And then we see Jesus chasing after Matthew. You see, he crossed all the way across the sea to chase after some demon-possessed men, just to turn right back around, cross the sea again to chase Matthew and call him into the family of God. Now recall the story of the Samaritan woman, because this is not the first time Jesus does something like this. We've got another picture here of the, the land where Jesus grew up and lived. See in the south here, that's um, Galilee, no, not, that's Judea, Judea, in the south there where the arrow s starts at the bottom, and Samaria is right in the middle, kind of that, that middle green section. And so wouldn't it make the most sense to just go right from Judea all the way up to Galilee where they wanted to go? We just go sh straight up. But that's not how Jews traveled back in the day. Because the Samaritans were, were half-breeds, right? The, we didn't, they didn't associate with Samaritans. So in the story, Jesus says, we're going to go up to Galilee, but first I have to go through Samaria. And all the disciples are a little bit confused because they're like, why are we going through Samaria? Jesus knew why he was going through Samaria. There was a woman who needed him, who needed the hope and the forgiveness that Jesus had. So instead of crossing over the Jordan River to go north, to cross back over the Jordan River to Galilee, like what normally would happen, they go straight through Samaria to reach out to this lost woman at the well. Just like Jesus saw the people who he passed every single day, Jesus sees you. You are the one that God is chasing after. Some of you need to hear this today. Are you listening? You are not too far gone. You are not too broken, too sinful, too shameful to anything for Jesus to love you. 
even before you were born. The God of the universe thought of you. He loved you. Even in your sin, he loved you and he died for you while you were still in your sin. That's how far Jesus went. That's how far Jesus went to the cross. He came all the way from heaven, lived a horrific life, and died a horrific death on earth to display his love for you. What did we all repeat during communion this morning? That verse, John 3.16. I love how Pastor Lynn brought that right into communion. Let's, let's read this together again. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. You see, this is God chasing after you. Jesus pursued and forgave one at a time. He reached in and felt the deeply each moment with whomever was in front of him. And he does the same for you. All we need to do is come to him. Do you have a hurt? Do you have some shame in your life? Some hidden part of your life that you think, I'm too far gone. I'm too broken. I'm too lonely. I'm too scared. I'm too afraid to be loved. Jesus is saying to you today, I love you. You are loved. You are delighted in. You are cherished. You are forgiven. You are a child of God. And he will never let you go. The invitation is this. Come to him today. Receive his loving embrace. Do you see his arms out wide for you, ready for a big old hug? Come before him today and hear him say, I love you. You are my child whom I love. I will never leave you. I will never forsake you. Back to Matthew for a second. Again, Matthew was outcast from his family. No Jews liked him. He was despised, but Jesus saw him. Jesus may have been the first person in years to address him, to invite him to anything. You see, loving people one at a time is the Jesus way of living. If you explore the Gospels, you'll find countless examples of where Jesus loved whomever was in front of him. Jesus gave their full attention. And one of the most often things said about Jesus when he was right in front of someone was he had compassion. He had compassion with whomever he was with. He recognized the suffering they were experiencing, the pain, the regret, the shame, and he took action. He healed, he mended the brokenhearted. Whether it was physical, emotional, relational, or spiritual, Jesus fulfilled those needs. When Jesus stood in front of someone, it was like time stopped. Have you ever felt that? Any special moments in life where where time has just stopped and you held on to that moment? Have you felt like God is pursuing you? Have you noticed the small ways and the big ways that he is telling you that he loves you? Because he is. I think sometimes we just don't pay enough attention to the ways in which he shows us his love. I remember myself growing up and beginning to feel this draw towards God. It began with my parents, who who had great love for me. And as I grew up and pursued independence, then I saw it in my sister. Because, you know, when teenagers are growing up, they're like, I don't want anything to do with my parents, right? which is a a natural part of growing up. But but when I grew up and and kind of separated myself from my parents a little bit, I saw it in my sister when she invited me to the youth group that she was going to. I was not a popular kid growing up. I, I had this weird, like, 
in-between state with a lot of groups because I fit in with a lot of groups because I, I was in sports, but I was also in the orchestra. And then I was part of accelerated classes, but I didn't go to the school specifically for advanced math and science. So I had friends in many different groups, but none of them really ever invited me to be part of their inner circle. And quite honestly, I felt pretty alone. I'm gonna say a couple words here that uh, some people might also dread lunchtime. Lunchtime was one of the worst parts of the day. Or whenever you got a new class. Because when in both of those scenarios, you'd, you'd walk into the lunchroom or you'd walk into that new classroom and you'd try to find somebody, just one person, that you could like eyeball and go, and go sit next to. And if you did find someone and you're like, I'm going to go sit next to this person, then you are afraid, what if their best friend has this same lunch and they wanted the spot that I just took? It was, it was difficult in those moments because I never felt like I quite belonged anywhere. But when I started to go to this youth group that my sister invited me to, I began to feel like I belonged, like I was valued. And it was the love that God had placed in my youth leader, in my youth pastor, and the other leaders, and the students that allowed me to start to feel like I belonged in this place. And I recognized that the love that God had for them was being displayed in the love that they had for me. And I also found this purpose, that instead of being a loner, instead of being alone, I was able to be the person who was able to reach out to those on the outskirts of the group to make them feel welcomed, even when I didn't at times. And this is what Jesus does for each of us. He sees us in our loneliness, in our brokenness, in our weakness. He wraps his arms around us and says, you belong here. I love you. I want you. And that's what we want to be as a church. We want to be welcoming to everyone, especially to the outsider and the broken the lost, and the needy. Isn't that the Jesus way? Do you remember the response of that one disciple who spoke up in the clip? You'll have to go back and, and look at it again, but I'll, I'll kind of flesh it out for us here. It's the one who kind of pulls Jesus aside and says, do you have any idea what this guy has done? Do you even know him? That's Peter. That's hard-headed Peter. He says, I don't get it. Jesus says this. Oh, I love Jesus' words here. You didn't get it when I chose you either. Whew. But Peter whips back a quick one here. But it's different. I'm not a tax collector. And Jesus says this. You hearing this? Get used to different. Have you gotten too comfortable? I have. Have we gotten too comfortable? Have we, like Peter, been the unwelcoming disciple? All of us shouldn't get why God pursued us and is pursuing us. None of us are deserving. But he chases after us anyways. Maybe, like Peter, we need to get used to different we need to get outside our comfort zone to love like Jesus did, to invite the outsider to be on the inside, so that we can say that it is Christ's love that compels us, that we might say that I am convinced that Jesus died for all, so that those who have new life in him should not live for ourselves, but for Christ and for the purpose of chasing after the one who is lost who Jesus came to serve. So I've got two takeaways for us this morning. We're going to go into another time of worship here as the worship team comes, but think about these two things. The God of the universe loves you. 
the God of the universe, the creator of the world, is chasing after you and your heart and your life. He says, I love you. You are cherished and you belong here. I don't care about your brokenness. I can heal that. I don't care about your sin. I've covered that. I don't care about any of the past life that you've lived. It is forgiven on the cross of Jesus. You are a child of God. If you've never given your life to Jesus, here's an invitation. God is reaching out to you. He says, I love you. You are mine. For those of us who are followers of Jesus, we need, be, we need to be prepared for when God's pursuit of us draws you <clears throat> to go beyond yourself, to reach out to the lost, to the broken, and to the needy of this world. Would you stand with me and pray? Jesus, we thank you for today. Lord, we thank you that you have chased after us tirelessly. That we might have a relationship with you. And Father, we just confess that we've been ignoring you sometimes. And your efforts to, to call us to yourself. But Lord, we turn to you now in this moment. We acknowledge the ways that you are chasing after us, that you love us. We just give you our lives. We give you our desires, our hopes, our dreams, our failures, our pasts. And we just lay them at your feet. Jesus, we can't do it on our own. We've tried. But Jesus, we need you to take control of our lives. We need you to lead us because we have made a mess. So Lord, heal me. Clean me. Make me whole again. Lord Jesus, we love you. We pray all these things in your name. continue in worship. just want to speak the name of Jesus till every dark addiction starts to break declaring there is hope and there is freedom I speak Jesus cause your name is power your name is healing your name is life. Break every stronghold, shine through the shadows, burn like a fire. And I just want to speak the name of Jesus over fear and all. To every wholesome captive by depression, I speak Jesus. Oh, 
Cause your name is power. Your name is healing. Your name is life. Break every stronghold. Shine through the shadows. Burn like a fire. Cause your name is power. Your name is healing, your name is life. Break every stronghold, shine through the shadows, burn like a fire. Shout Jesus from the mountains and Jesus in the streets. Jesus in the darkness over every enemy. Jesus for my family, I speak the holy name. Jesus. Oh, 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 oh. shout Jesus from the mountains. And Jesus in the streets. And Jesus in the darkness over every enemy. Jesus for my family, I speak the holy name, Jesus. Your name is power, your name is healing, your name is life. You break every stronghold, shine through the shadows. I just want to speak the name of Jesus over every heart and every mind. Cause I know there is peace within your presence. I speak Jesus. Amen. You guys are dismissed. Have a great week. God bless.